So I, I'm multitasking. It's a good thing that I realized I was on the air. So no uh, inappropriate language came out of my mouth. So here we go. We'll go back. We'll get started. Uh, and again, technology is wonderful. A uh, good thing for me. I know how to just sort of go with the punches there. Uh, thank you all that are typing. Now, I bear with me. Uh, doing this and looking at uh, the smartphone to look at the chat uh, can be a little bit different for my old eyes. And so I'll do my best. But as we saw uh, the video from Dragnet now, I saw a lot of the attendees and the people attending this event probably a lot younger than me. Uh, even Dragnet was a little bit before my time. I saw them in uh, reruns. But one of the things I just really want to put out there as a caveat is that uh, the information that we're going to share or that I'm going to share today is uh, an amalgamation of many professional experiences I've had over the years. And so the names, uh, agencies, or people, uh, they've been changed to protect the innocent and maybe not the certain, uh, necessarily uh, the innocent as well. Uh, these are really just a conglomeration of uh, many experiences I've had. I've been doing this for 30 years. And so you'll see uh, stories. You'll hear stories that I've taken and I've put together from uh, various experiences that, that, that I've had. So uh, please don't think it's from any agency if you knew me there or know me of there. I, I, um, again, these are just uh, a built-in for everybody. So that's my, that's my caveat for everybody here today. So as we begin, I am John Kiefer, and I want to thank you all for allowing me to uh, be here today to present and to talk. I really want to thank Jenny Berg and the Leadership Council for Nonprofits. Profits, and now you get to hear that again. <laughs> so I want to thank them for allowing me to be there, and I really want to thank Vanessa, and I want to thank Ryan, who's on the, the back end. And so uh, Ryan uh, says he can't do anything about my makeup. And but he can try to help us with all the technical stuff that if I screw up, we'll be good to go. So who am I? Why should you uh, listen to me? And uh, some of the participants, I see a lot of friends out there, co-workers, former co-workers, really great knowledgeable people. And I, I may even be speaking to the choir on a lot of this. Uh, but I do think that, as Vanessa mentioned, we're changing. We're, we've been changing in the social services field, nonprofits field for quite some time and our paradigms are shifting. And there was a time period way back when nonprofits were looking to for-profits for guidance on how to operate and uh, create systems that modeled or that were very similar to the for-profit world. And we're again shifting and changing now because of COVID. And I saw a lot of people commented about COVID and I certainly believe that uh, change, there's always opportunity. And so I think there's a lot of blessings hidden in a lot of this. So who am I? John Kiefer. I've been doing nonprofit work for about 31 years. And if I showed you a resume, it would probably really confuse you. And that's okay. I still haven't decided what I'd like to be when I grew up. But I like to learn and I like to grow and I enjoy helping others. So I've been doing nonprofit and I've been in the executive level for about 31 years now. And I've won. I've been blessed. I've been a part of teams that have won. Right now, a little over 100 international, national, state, regional awards and recognitions. And I was a former police officer. I am a former police officer. And that's where I started out. Uh, I would have uh, uh, retired along with my dear friend, Sonny Kim. You know, we started Police Academy. and actually started college uh, in the same class together. And uh, would have been retired by now if I would have stayed in. But things have a way of changing. Me. I've had a vast background. You say, well... John, why should we listen to you? What have you done? And i uh, done a lot of consulting. I spent about 15 years and still do some, although uh, most of my company uh, uh, is run by a, a partner. Uh, but I've been consulting for nonprofits uh, that have been started up by professional athletes and uh, uh, some comedians, some actors, and WWE. And I've had an interesting career, especially in my time uh, that I spent up in New England, uh, working up in Foxborough and Rhode Island uh, with several of my clients who played for the New England Patriots. And, and so I still now uh, serve on a few boards, uh, only one locally, uh, but I sit on some uh, that are out of state and my involvement still with people in the nonprofit world and from my former career with pro athletes and, and helping and guiding them and building good, solid nonprofits. But a lot of that is really starting to help invigorate the boards. I still do, do some groundwork. 
from an instructor in a police academy. I'm certified by the state of Ohio. Ohio, and I teach on human trafficking investigations and missing persons, and I teach uh, community diversity and procedural justice and several other victims' rights and needs, things that really go in line with the work that I love doing and, and keeping myself fresh with boots on the ground experience as well as high-level executive uh, uh, work as well in guiding the ship. And I'm also certified by NOVA as a victim advocate, and there's some work that I did with a prior agency that allowed me to get into this field and to get these certifications. So it looks like everybody can still hear me and I'm looking down and looking all over. So bear with me. I have the bifocals that sometimes work for me and sometimes don't. But here we go. So you see this photo when helping hurts, how boards can avoid doing harm to the nonprofits. I, I love this photo because you have the horse uh, facing the wrong way. And the one thing we can all agree is that that carriage will move. It will certainly go somewhere, uh, but how it will get there and how fast or uh, and what shape it will get there certainly uh, is up to the imagination. And, and who knows uh, how it could go. And I think that photo sometimes can be representative of the things that we do in the nonprofit world and to understand our roles. You'll hear me talk about roles and and understanding it's one of the things that I really saw a lot. And I know a lot of people, if you're from Cincinnati, you, you may not like this team. And I, I had clients with the Bengals as well. And so I don't uh, really follow any team anymore. I don't have a fan. I'm not a fan of, uh, of any uh, team nowadays. But uh, with my brief experience of about 15 years with Patriots players, uh, you learn some things and you get to see some things. And one of the things that uh, Belichick, and again, don't start sending me things about of Belichick. I don't, I don't watch the games and uh, don't pay attention to that, but uh, every player had this beat into them about do your job, know your role, do your job. And so it's very important in nonprofits and everywhere and everywhere else that we all know our role and that we work. And by doing that, focusing on what we do, we can actually achieve and move the bar forward in those we serve. And so we all have to know as an executive director, I, I have to be sort of the coach and manage the team so that we can progress forward. And the boards uh, would be like the general manager to coordinate and be 60,000 people to get us where we, where we need to go and look at that long-term vision. And so today, some things we'll talk about uh, could be personal, maybe. Uh, if any of these characteristics are you, the great thing is we're all human beings. We can change. Uh, I probably suffer from some of these, and, and it's an ongoing process, as we know, in the social service field. We always have to uh, check ourselves uh, before we do good for anybody else. We have to sort of check our issues as well before we can help anybody else. So how boards can avoid doing harm. And the, the topic when helping hurts is I think we come from a place where everybody wants to do good. They've got uh, good in their heart. They want to help. And it's just somewhere in the mix. Somewhere along the road is where we get a little confused. Found this from the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits. It's a nonprofit life cycle. And one of the things that we need to constantly do in nonprofits is evaluate ourselves uh, individually and as an agency. And the cartoon, if it shows up pretty good on your side, it says, what if we don't change at all and something magical just happens? Has anybody ever sat on a nonprofit or in an agency where you just kind of exist? Uh, you do what you've been doing and you keep doing what you've been doing. And so I pose a question to you is, um, you know, can you grow without change? Is it possible to just keep doing what you've been doing? And so to me or for me, I want you to think about that. And maybe you'll even post some comments about, you know, can you be uh, continue to do what you've been doing and, and not change, but still have impact and grow? in the community can still serve mission uh, without change and growth. I think that's a question that uh, all of us have to ask. And, and I, for one, we talk about COVID and we just spent the opening keynote speaker talking about uh, this pandemic and how it's changed us. And I remember when it first hit us, we had about two weeks of almost like a, a, a punch in the gut where what do we do? How, how, do we, how do we work if we're suffering how are the people we're serving? How are they doing through all of this? And, and, and it really set a path for 
and not just for me, but for the team and even for the board to reevaluate very quickly so that we can meet the needs of the people that we serve. And so I asked that question for you. If you can, you know, look at this chart, where's your agency? Are you a startup? Now, I've been blessed and maybe not blessed. I've, I've worked from everything from a startup, nothing, uh, literally from doing the paperwork for the IRS uh, to all the way to a large agency and in various roles. And all of them still need to reflect and address where they're at. If you're a mature agency, if you start to be stagnant, uh, and if you're on the declining end, and board members can play a key and crucial and pivotal role in this. And as we talk about throughout this whole thing, we'll look at nine characteristics, but Vanessa said this earlier that I, that I liked and I saw in the chat, it said, you know, it's about leading with relationships and everything that we do is leading with relationships to help us grow and help us build because we all want to serve more mission. So nine board member characteristics that will harm an agency. These, these are just nine that I've highlighted. I'm sure there's plenty more and uh, some overlap, of course, but you know, not knowing what the organization does, having a big ego, that can be a tough one for everybody. They're diving into operations. And this is probably where there's a collective uh, from maybe some executive directors and CEOs. Uh, that's where sometimes a rub can happen uh, between uh, those two positions, uh, between board members and executives, executive directors and CEOs. Monday morning quarterback, the chief executive, we'll talk about this because there is an aspect of that's important uh, for people to do for us to be successful. Uh, but there's some bad and unproductive ways for that. There's ways we can correct it. And not engaging in board meetings. Pushing your own pet projects. I put in parentheses being a bully donor. So if you're an executive director, if you're an executive leadership, probably a lot of good development uh, directors are on this line. And it's one of the balances that you have when you have a board member who, who sits on the board, but is also a significant donor. And you want to meet their needs, but you also have to look at the overall mission. And so we'll talk about this. Thinking you're the boss of day-to-day -day operations. Now, this can be tough for a lot of people, especially people who are, uh, leaders in their field and in their uh, other life. And so a uh, weak board chair. Now we'll look at the terms weak and strong. And I, I, these terms, they're being defined differently nowadays and rightfully so. So when I say weak, we don't, I don't really mean impish. Uh, uh, we used the term back in the day, this might date me, milk toast. Uh, not like that. What we talk about is inconsistent, uh, not structured. Uh, so when we use those terminologies, that's what we're talking about is inconsistent and not structured. And so uh, when we talk about strong, we're talking about other things, uh, not really strength and overpowering, et cetera. We're talking about the different concepts uh, there. So, and remember not being uh, a promoter of your agency's mission. And so I skipped ahead there. I hit the button too soon, but not being a promoter. We're all ambassadors, right? That's probably a little pet peeve of mine. I spend most of my day being an ambassador for the agencies I represent. And that is essentially what the board members' roles are supposed to be as well, if it serves an ambassador. So we look at our first unproductive practice, the first characteristic of an unproductive practice. And when we look at this one, uh, the first one is, does the board member know the mission and vision? Can the board member articulate the mission and vision and services to accomplish both? Have you ever done a phone call with all of your board members? If you're an executive director, if you're in a leader, leadership position, I would, I would say even your development directors or your high level development people as well. If you spent that time annually just doing a one-on-one -on -one call and asking a simple question, it's, you know, do you know our mission and our vision? And you know, what, what does it mean to you? A lot of people get the mission and vision confused with the programs. And as we'll talk later when we talk about uh, bully donors and pet projects, is that sometimes that can really confuse overall mission and strategic plan uh, when people become too overly involved and enmeshed emotionally with programs. And so uh, I did, I've done these for years, and I can remember a time. Uh, when it's called every board member and set up our time for coffee or for a meeting and ask, and overwhelmingly what it solves, 
that typically uh, in the last few that I've been involved in is that people had a form of what the mission and vision was. They had the idea but didn't really know. And what that says to me is that more work has to be done to emphasize the mission and vision. And as we talk about correcting a lot of unproductive practices, but one of the things that would be helpful for you is always come back to the mission. If you make that a focal point, it usually will cut out a lot of these other unproductive characteristics that we can see in individuals. So you want to know, can the board member articulate the mission, vision, and services? Usually when we say that, we're talking about in all major speeches. So how can we avoid this mistake? So we want to encourage new members to learn that elevator speech. A good development director, a good executive director, CEO, uh, knows how to do that pitch. I think we, we, we're we good salespeople. I probably take more uh, sales courses and read more sales books uh, than I do anything else, uh, even in the field, because that's really a lot of my role, is to be the ambassador and to know how to interact with people and do what Vanessa and somebody in the chat room that, that mentioned is leading through relationships. And so this is what this is all about. And even for our, our board members, uh, we have to help them to understand this elevated pitch. And we need to do that within a short period of time, you know, the who, what, when, where, why of the agency. And get the board members, as we said, uh, I just had a recent conversation with one of the sponsors, Ann Maxfield, who's a tremendous consultant and I love her to death. Uh, but one of the things that we we talked about is, is this understanding of the 60,000 feet. We all talk about it, but what does that really mean? And, what does that look like for board members? Um, so board members need to know what the agency offers, not just their personal favorite program. But think about this. Do you, do you have a board member, and I'm sure you do, yeah, even I have uh, personal preferences in some of the programs that are offered by some of the agencies that deal with those that have multiple programs. Uh, but I have to remember when I put on that board member's hat, I'm there to look out across the universe to see the long-term plan for this agency, and that's where I need to fly in order to do my role, do my job to help that agency progress and move forward. And so I'm looking through as I see people uh, chatting through there, and I'll go back and I'll look for questions as well, but thank you for these comments as well. It's very helpful. This is very new for everybody, this whole Zoom presentation. So I uh, appreciate it. But yes, we want to be at 60,000 feet, and uh, metaphorically speaking, but when you sit on that understanding that you have a good executive director, and if you don't, you don't have a good CEO, then then you failed in a part of your responsibilities, including uh, that good person, uh, because you need to allow them to do what they do while you look at that long-term, higher plane, higher altitude vision. And so you can avoid a lot of the uh, un uh, unproductive practices and avoid that mistake by encouraging uh, board members to know the elevator pitch and by encouraging to always understand it at 60,000 feet and how to operate it at 60,000 feet and the things that you do. Uh, here's a tough one. It's tough for a lot of people. This was tough when I worked with athletes and celebrities. This was huge. Having a big ego. What made many of these athletes and the celebrities that I still work with today and I get uh, consulted with is that they do have egos. They're driven to succeed. That can be very difficult for a nonprofit that has a very strong ego-centered person on the board uh, because a lot of the people that are coming on the board, if you're getting good, diverse boards, they may be the master and commander in their day-to-day -day job. They may be at the height or pinnacle of their career and may be well-known even in the community. Um, and, and they may be very smart in other capacities. But the one thing is that with the board, we have to work together. And if you have somebody that uh, everything is about their ego, it's going to be unproductive ultimately. Now, I'm speaking to us executive directors and CEOs as well. I can suffer from this too. I've, I've had moments where I've been around 30 years and I've been in meetings where it's come to my mind and probably even slipped out of my mouth where I've said, that, hey, I've been doing this for 30 years, trust me. But even I can still learn. We have to remember that, and, and I'm speaking to myself on this, so I'm not beating anybody else up. But how can we avoid uh, this mistake? You know, what are the things that we can do to 
to avoid this mistake so that we can be better servants for our neighborhood. Now, it sounds like a cliche, but board service is a servant leader requirement. Now, I know this sounds like a cliche, and, and people misinterpret it quite a bit. If you ever wrote, uh, read the book, Servant Leadership, one of the things it talks about in there is that this doesn't mean that you're falling around everybody, mopping behind them, sweeping behind them. I, I personally like to do that occasionally. It helps keep me grounded and centered. Uh, but it really just means that our normal paradigm of a power structure from being the triangle, and here's the board and CEO, and focusing down to the frontline workers and the clients, is inverted. And we need to shift that. And so you know, the board's job is to fly high to look out across the universe to provide the tools that are necessary for the executive director to provide the tools for the staff to meet the needs of clients. And so we avoid this big ego. I try to avoid it by doing things to help keep me humble. And board members, there is that mix of volunteering and being on the board and giving some time to just be on the front line to, I think, you know, again, humble yourself. In many organizations, when I talk about the big athletes, I have one in particular who's very famous. Uh, the, the yeah, massive ego, uh, massive heart. Both were uh, sometimes would baffle each other, but massive heart that this person would be out. Uh, he had a leadership training uh, for young people and be out in the woods getting muddy and dirty, working side by side. And that's what balanced him out, uh, especially in a world of professional athletes where everybody tells you how great you are. That can happen too with board members in, who are successful in their realm and get sort of that same feedback and, and not get all the reality. The other way is to listen. Ask questions instead of telling everyone what you know. Uh, I like to think I know a lot, but I also know I don't know a lot. Um, when I think of this, there's a good friend of mine that we work together. We both are Columbo fans. And if you love Columbo, put it in the chat because I'd love to know uh, anybody who likes Lieutenant Columbo. Now, it's not because they used to be a police officer. It's because he was so disarming in how he approached everything, but yet so inquisitive and listened to details, things that most of us would miss. And so part of avoiding that mistake of having the big ego is really become a listener. You know, ask more questions uh, than you make statements. And remember, board members guide the organization. It's not making edicts or demands. You can do that in a for-profit world. When you own a company, uh, which I have as a consultant, you have a partner and head employees, uh, you can pass edicts and mandates, whether you should or shouldn't, we can all debate. But in an organization, we're guiding. The board members are guiding the organization. And that's that's the primary difference. Uh, it's not a system of handing out edicts and uh, passing down laws and rules. I'm going to video here that I really like. I just stay in my lane. It's like this is back to self-awareness. I stay in my lane. I'm a salesman. I'm a business builder. I've done it my whole life. I was an F student at 13 and 14. My friend's parents told my friends not to hang out with me because I was a loser. I'm more successful than my entire graduating class combined. Like, like, this is because the market doesn't understand that people don't get it. You have to double down on your strengths and you have to punch your weaknesses. In America, there's billions of dollars made on selling you how to fix the things that you're not good at. It's a huge mistake. You need to figure out who you are and go all in. That's what I did. And so when you talk about business or marketing, when you talk about the New York Jets, and when you talk about wine, I've got nothing but bravado. Everything else, you should see me sitting around dinner tables right now talking about politics. The level of humility and the level of listening, you wouldn't expect from me because that's not how you're used to consuming me. I'm loud and proud because I only stay in my lane. Pay very close attention. I've got nine years of content on the internet now, maybe a little bit more. I stay very, very, very narrow. For me, it's lucky. <laughs> So we'll fast forward. The rest of this is really cool music if you're into it. Uh, but this guy he talks about staying in your lane, and and that is it's it's a word I've been saying a lot. I have to admit I heard it maybe seven years ago by somebody younger, and I had to ask what is that. But Sarah and Heather, you all posted in the chat about 
uh, two things. Board meetings that were 90% report out and 10% discussion. Been there. Really have been there. And and that can be frustrating, and we can talk about that. But certainly as an executive director or CEO, what I thrive on so much is that back and forth. You know, boards, for me, are a place to get information that I may not have the expertise in or that I might be in the weeds and I can't get high enough and I need that sort of unfettered advice or opinion from that higher level to help us achieve or solve a problem. And, and, and so, yes, those 90% report outs, 10% discussion. You oftentimes wonder, couldn't we just send us in an email uh, and be quicker? Uh, and so that is, is sort of rub in, in a lot of things. And how that's fitting in now with the Zoom calls, et cetera, and building discussion can be very difficult. And Sarah, the send agendas uh, are phenomenal as well. But the gentleman we just had on there, he talks about staying in your lane. Know what you know. And, you know, there's a, a wonderful theory in a book, the 80-20 rule, and it's about, you know, 20% of your efforts get 80% of your results. And so, so many people will focus on uh, things that are just outside of where they are. And, and a lot of it could be the ego, uh, could be self-esteem, but understanding that as a board member, we don't know everything, but we do have to know our lane as a board member, and that's government. And so you won't function. You cannot uh, be effective if you can't stay in your lane. So you got to stay at the strategic level, uh, diving into operations, getting the weeds, cloud things. And I've seen this happen a lot where you have strong personalities, especially organizations that have uh, board members who volunteer on a day-to-day -day basis. Role confusion can become a nightmare. An employment nightmare can become an operational nightmare, a strategic nightmare. You just have a lot of ripple effect and, and uh, damage. And so how do we how do we avoid that? Stay in your lane. It's real simple. I, I heard an employee of mine uh, several years ago uh, tell another employee uh, when they were having a discussion and said, stay in your lane. And I think that's important. Remember, we've got to sort the eagles. Uh, there's a lot of turkeys. <laughs> we've got to leave them alone. Uh, they got this. Now, I'm not calling us turkeys. I, maybe I am a turkey. Uh, the frontline staff, but what I have found that when you give your frontline teams a left and a right fence and you give them an area of freedom and you tell them where we're going with our mission, if you're making the mission uh, as a centerpiece and focal point, they'll do amazing things and you'll achieve things that you didn't realize you could. And so that's from an executive director level. It's the same thing at the board level. If you can create that vision, that long-term strategic plan with your director and CEO and, and allow that allow them to do their work on the playing field, you'll see massive things. So you don't help your agency. You don't help the mission if you're walking in the weeds. You just won't. You hired an executive director and CEO, let them carry out the mission. Now, this is important. There's a lot of uh, new agencies. There's a group out right now that I've been researching. They've been out for a while called Nano, N-A-N-O-E. And they have a philosophy. They're trying to reform the paradigm uh, for nonprofits. And essentially that board members uh, hire strong CEOs, strong leadership. And that strong leadership uh, really controls uh, things. And the board, they bring certain skill sets. And, and, but they really dive deep into that. But it's an asset to look at. Some of the material is good. Some of the costs. Uh, but it's Certainly something that's worthwhile looking at. Our next unproductive practice, a Monday morning quarterback. Now, we all, if you're into sports, I used to be. I have a seven-year-old daughter, so I haven't watched any sports for seven years. I've watched a lot of LOLs, LPS, and uh, stuff in this. Uh, so no sports really at all for years. But... You know, there is an aspect of Monday morning quarterback that's a part of the board responsibility. But uh, we also call this the person who came late to the party. You, you know that person that they show up late and they have an opinion on everything, uh, of how it should be, how to do. You haven't heard from them. If they came late, everybody's into it, and they say, boy, you really should have done this. You should have had that. Being a person, a Monday morning quarterback, also being a person who doesn't participate, but then interjects their thoughts, uh, their comments. That maybe you'll show up in here and that'll drive you nuts too. Does me as well. Uh, when people 
uh, interject later. They don't attend. They don't read the board minutes. They don't comment. We talked about 90% report out, 10% discussion. When there's not that discussion, but then once you're in the mix of it, people have an opinion about you go. Really difficult. And we had a circumstance I remember many years ago. Uh, if you know Dave Ramsey, he's one of many people that's probably uh, very knowledgeable when it comes to financial literacy, etc. Now, he is a religious person, and some people have issues with secular and non-secular and programs, but it's successful. It's been proven to, to work, and it was approved to try to offer this with an institution I'm supporting, and everything was set up, and then later on, uh, one person emailed uh, the leadership team and said, well, he mentions the state too much. And in, in his podcast on his radio show, there's not, wasn't a lot of that in the actual materials, but... It, the program had already started before this person felt comfortable to bring it up. And at that point, it's a little difficult. And you're not doing your duty and you're being unproductive if you wait that way. And the other part of this is believing you're the only one with an original idea. We can all suffer from that. If there's people on here who know me, who probably sat across the table, and they may accuse me of, of this from time to time. It's okay. I'm an imperfect person. How do we avoid this? Being inquisitive. That's Lieutenant Colombo. Ask questions. Assuming your co-members uh, haven't done their work, that's not okay. So when you come late to the party, there's a lot of people been working on this, other board members. And I've seen this a lot. I've seen people, especially in terms of finances, especially in terms of operations, where board members aren't involved, don't ask questions, and then later on they bring up issues, and then that's where they sort of, uh, that's the hill where they choose to die on with these discussions. And it stifles. And it also is a killer of energy. It's a life sucker. Other board members can get tired of it, and then they want to vacate. You can lose some really good people. You want to be part of the process as it goes. But don't come to the party late and complain about the theme, the music, and food. You want to be a part of the process. You have to ask yourself constantly, why did I join this board in the first place? Anybody here uh, on an HOA board? <laughs> I am. I think I wanted to quit within my first week when I was elected. Uh, but again, if you allow yourself to be ground level into the weeds, not fly high, you can feel that energy sucked out of you pretty quickly. And so it's important to avoid that unproductive mistake and to make sure that you're doing the things that are progressing and moving you forward. And if you notice, there's a common theme. And the common theme is it's not about you. None of this is about you. It's got to be about the mission. Not engaging in board meetings. So we talked about this, this unproductive practice. And at Sarah, I think it was you or it might have been Heather, but talked about that 90%. Oh, I've been in those meetings. And you wonder, is anybody listening? Knock, knock. Anybody awake? Am, am I boring? Do you not care? There's something else going on in your life. It's even worse when somebody doesn't speak, but then later on sends you 20 emails or sends the board 20 emails instead of talking right there in that forum. Uh, never asking questions, waiting until later to ask outside of board meetings or committee. Us as executive directors and leadership, well, we've got to think about this a little bit because sometimes when people aren't speaking, they might not understand. So we have to flush that out. When we do the annual one-on-ones with each board member, that's one of the things you really want to flush out. A lot of people shy away from finances because right? they don't understand and they want to ask questions. And it's important for us as the leadership to find that. Communicating via post meeting. That's the, you have the meeting, you have the 90% uh, report out, 10% discussion, and then there's just hundreds and hundreds of emails back and forth. Not appropriate, not appropriate timing, uh, but that can tell you something about an unproductive characteristic somebody has. And using the board meeting for a personal agenda. And I've, sadly, I've seen that. But this can happen a lot of time. Personalities can clash. I can tell you when I work for athletes, a lot of them want to put the family members on the board. And I worked for a really great one. Uh, I did it. I also was a marketing agent. And um, so there was a lot of interconnectivity uh, with work. The nonprofit mom and dad sat on the board. They might have not been in an agreement. Uh, would look for me as a mediator. Uh, these are things that can really slow down mission and really put you into the weeds. And so we've got to remember when we look at productive practices, recognize your own personality trait. I have to recognize mine. Uh, I'm, I'm a go-getter. 
And so you have to recognize from as a board member, recognize your personality trait and really shift in some cases. If you're the one that never asks questions, but you send out the emails afterwards or, or you're just always quiet, you gotta lose your fear to ask questions in the board meeting. You gotta stay on topic and you need to be professional. But you have to ask. If you don't understand, most people will assume you do and move forward. And you're not being helpful if you're flying in the clouds too long for that executive director and not understanding. If something's unclear, ask a question. I oftentimes, it's, I take us back to Lieutenant Colombo, and you'll, you'll all learn a lot about Lieutenant Colombo today. But ask those questions. We don't know we don't know, and we can oftentimes make assumptions based off of things that really are conversations we've had in our own head. Pushing your own pet projects. So putting uh, what you like in your special project ahead of the overall mission and programs. Uh, putting your desires over all organizational goals. And I lumped in being a bully donor here. I lumped that in. Um, I don't know if anybody's experienced that, but you know that can happen. If you have somebody, especially in a small nonprofit, if you happen to have somebody who has significant wealth or opportunities that can donate, they can really take control uh, of your organization. And that in and of itself can be extremely unproductive. unproductive. This is one of my favorite movies. We'll, so hopefully you all can hear it, but I'm, I'm going to play this part and then I'll, I'll describe it in case it sounds not as good. Well, that large window that just from George and the I should very much like the compliments of St. George to guess my late husband. So, all right, so the bishop's wife. I talked to Jenny Berg about this uh, yesterday, the day before when we were testing. My favorite movie, absolute favorite. I have to watch this every every Christmas. Can't get around it. But this particular donor, so if you know the story, I'm sorry, but essentially significant donor, the bishop wants to build the church, and this donor wants everything to be an homage to her uh, which is awesome, and you know we're all thankful for the gift, uh, but all the details. And so she says uh, the big stained glass window of St. George killing the dragon, she wants St. George to resemble her husband. And the bishop says, uh, you know, who do you see? <laughs> what resemblance do you see for the dragon? And and we've all dealt with this. We've had significant donors. When you work for an athlete, and when I've worked for an athlete, I've worked for leaders uh, who've set up their own nonprofits, private nonprofits, they're strong personalities, and when they're funding a lot of the money, a lot of the people around them will take a lesser position, a more inferior position, allow them to make all the changes. And, and that's unproductive because it's just one viewpoint. Uh, but you can't allow somebody to have their pet projects. I've seen organizations where they'll have uh, one-off projects, seasonal programs, etc. Everybody loves and makes you feel good. But all that energy will dive into that, but we'll forget about the other 364 days of the year unproductive practice for a nonprofit. So what, so what do you do? How do you avoid this? And your own idea must be reconciled with overall mission of the organization. You have to advocate for the agency, not just your favorite program or project. So when we go back to that first unproductive practice and we talk about um, knowing the mission and vision, a lot of people will talk about programs and not the mission and the vision. And that is so important. So we have to stay focused on that 60,000 feet. And here, I, here's where all the, the uh, probably the executive director, CEO, sit there and say, uh-huh. Hey, you're not the bar, the, the, as a board member, you're not everyone's supervisor. So thou shalt not act like you're the boss of me or anybody. <laughs> so you, you are the manager collectively through the chair of the executive director and CEO, but you have to remember your role when you interact with staff members and frontline workers and with the clients. So thinking you're the boss of all day-to-day -day operations, thinking that because you're a board member, you're the boss of all employees, creating a relationship with subordinates that are inappropriate. Boy, have I seen this. I've, I've helped athletes and I've helped celebrities who put family members in paid positions and they're not trained and they're not qualified. Um, board members who volunteer on a specific program, they'll connect with a staff member and it can cloud roles. Circumventing the chief executive or executive director. 
Now I can see if you're if you're an executive director, you're really you're really probably saying, "Oh, been there, been there." Uh, but I think a lot of people in our town, and from the list I saw of participants, you guys are doing pretty good. Uh, so how do you avoid this? You may be the boss at home. I like to think I am, but I get reminded quite a bit by my wife and my daughter that I am not. I'm living in my fantasy world, but you're not the boss of everybody. And don't cross boundaries. Staff work and are governed by the executive director. Understand that role, honor it, respect it, uh, be a part of that, be a team player with that, and understand how that interacts. Some more unproductive practices. I really like this uh, because so many people can put their head in the sand when they see this because they don't know what to do. And so they allow these practices to go on and it just stops the nonprofit. This is very important. When I did these nine characteristics, it's not really in any order of importance, uh, but a week board chair will be poor board performance. Now, wherever the head points, that body's going to follow. And so when we use the term weak, as we said, it's really just about being inconsistent. Uh, it's, it's about not um, being inquisitive, not doing the consensual or the consent uh, format, uh, not being involved, but also holding the bylaws and accountability of the board members. That can lead to a really wonky, as a new term for me, uh, organization that can stifle growth and stifle mission. How you avoid that? You got to educate your board chair on nonprofits. If they're successful in the for profit world, that doesn't always translate to nonprofit world. There are differences. We can learn a lot from for profits, but there is a difference, and we need to educate that. The board chair and the chief executive must work as a team, and the board chair must hold the board accountable, and that's the hard part. That's really hard to do, to so hold uh, people in the community, and especially organizations where they all might live. A lot of the board members might live in the same community, might go to the same church, might be even a part of a similar uh, sphere of influence. But there's ways to hold people accountable that's not attacking, but it's upholding your fiduciary responsibility to be a good steward and to be an effective leader for the nonprofit. So these are the things that you have to focus on with the board chair. If you have a weak one, you're going to struggle. As we wind down here, uh, Don King, I, if anybody's old enough, Don King, you have to say, well, however you feel about it, it's a great promoter. And so you need to improve your net promoter score. That's what CEOs, executive directors need. They need a nonprofit board member who is a promoter. And Peter Brinkerhoff, if you've read his book, remember it's mission, mission, mission. Oh, by the way, no money, no mission. But this is a mantra I've stolen. I use all the time because it is about mission and it is, and money is involved. You don't sacrifice one for the other. You can walk on two legs. You can have great mission and great programmatic success and still be a good financial steward. And you need your board members to be promoters of the agency. You can't exist. You help nobody if you can't have additional promoters. It's also called the law of duplication or compounding interest as they talk in finance firms, but duplicating yourself. See, if John Kiefer alone can do so much, I only have so much time, so much energy, so much knowledge, but if I can duplicate John Kiefer and I've got 10 of them and we're all focused on the same mission, look how much more we can do. So how do we avoid this unproductive practice? Ask for help from your chief executive. All right, the elevator speech. The elevator pitch. If you're fearful of asking for donations, be a door opener. Make introductions, connections. Be the person that says, hey, I'd like you to meet John. Would you mind having coffee? Well, of course, we all can't do coffee right now. But hey, would you jump in on a Zoom call and, uh, and meet with your executive director? Be that door opener, that ambassador to other people. Now, I've rushed you through, and hopefully I didn't have anybody sleep. I know there might be some questions, and I'll have to take off these glasses, uh, but I do want to say thank you all very much. Helping doesn't have to hurt. It shouldn't hurt, and helping should feel good. And here's a little message from Trevor I'm now. so glad we had this time together Just to have a laugh or sing a song Since we just get started I'll stop, Carol. I, I love Carol Burnett. If you're from my day and age, uh, that was one of my favorite shows that I get to watch now in reruns on some great TVs. 
And sorry for the hiccup uh, earlier. Now I'm going to look and see if there were any significant questions. And, and Marlene, thank you. Uh, if it hasn't come out, I'm a needy person. I need my ego. Uh, really thank you. Thank you for saying you enjoyed it, uh, despite the interruptions. Uh, do all of you have board members go through training through the Attorney General's office? Jonathan, you put that up there. And boy, I tell you what, uh, I haven't done that training yet. But I think it's important because a lot of people don't understand the legal ramifications. When I talked about board members who thought they were the boss of everybody and they interacted with staff, I don't think they fully understand employment laws. And what when they speak to a staff member, it appears as if they're representing the agency. It can create a lot of uh, turmoil. And I've seen that. And it also opens the other board members up to potential liability. And the AG's office can talk about your fiduciary responsibilities or legal responsibilities as well. So Jonathan, grade one. Um, if you can share that, Jonathan, on the link, that would be awesome. And so we talk about uh, board members and handbooks. I, I, I'm helping another organization has not had a handbook. They've made rules and regulations. They can't find them. Uh, so people forget about them and they say, oh, we, you know, we approved this way back. There's no central repository. Uh, there's no handbook, no application process. You really should be vetted. And, and I know for us, on our end, we want bodies. We need bodies. But we really want this person because they're a titan in their community or, or they're just that financially they're successful and they could really help us. But we have to be selective as well. And we have to understand we're offering something too. Uh, not only to them, it's not tangible. Uh, for most people, it's a feeling, it's emotional. But it, we're offering something as well. We need to train and onboard people. And, and if we don't do that, we've done a disservice. We can complain about the people that were heavy-handed, had big egos, a weak chair. But we haven't done our job of training. That's tough for executive directors and tough for CEOs sometimes because you're worried about the relationship and your job. Uh, but I think if you do your job well and if you lead with relationships, you can get through these. So, Jonathan, uh, Jeff, Jeff O'Neill, uh, typical challenges. And, and I appreciate validating. I, I didn't share this for years. I, I got my start as a police officer. I worked undercover. I was on The Wiz, uh, which is a local radio station in Cincinnati with Ray Red. And so we would talk about community issues, and I'd have to wear a wrestling mask. So people couldn't see me when we do visits. Obviously, on the radio, I looked amazing. Uh, but uh, on the radio, they couldn't see what I looked like. But I had to hide uh, that for uh, public appearances. And then I ended up having a show on WCIN. I took over from there in the morning when uh, uh, former Mayor Lucan you know, couldn't uh, meet his uh, obligations there. It was all about discussing community issues. And one of the things when we talked about, about validating, that I think we need that amongst ourselves. Uh, quite frankly, I'm, I'm very blessed to have several uh, CEOs, executive directors. We meet uh, sometimes together when we can safely do so, but over Zoom, we just talk about the challenges we're facing at our level and getting through that and sharing ideas and concepts and being a support group. And I think we all need to be validated. So, Jeff, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think we're about five, six minutes out of time. I'll answer any more. And, oh, gosh, Renee. Uh, Renee, I'll pronounce your last name wrong, but I'm going to say McCain. Eager. might be McFedden. Pro bono partnerships of Ohio are wonderful. If you don't know about them, learn about them and make contact. Uh, use them many times. And so they are just absolutely, absolutely wonderful people. So uh, again, make sure that you reach out. So PBO, uh, uh, yeah, PBO partnership of Ohio is great. And then Jonathan, uh, and I'm not going to try your last name either, but I'll screw it up. But the legal boot camp that he's talking about is coming up really good. Now, here's the struggle you'll find is can you get some of these titans of industry and titans of the community to take time out to attend these courses? You have to build that culture of knowledge and education. And I mentioned Ann Maxfield, who's a consultant. I, I consult uh, all over. It, it's uh, not an ego thing to say, hey, I need – I need a third party, a disinterested third party to come in and, and assess and give feedback uh, because, uh, like the old saying goes, no one listens to a prophet in their hometown. And that can happen from time to time. And so uh, using some outside resources and building that culture of learning and education is one of them. So uh, appreciate everything, Jeff. Uh, and it, I'm sure that 
you know, somebody there who uh, may have an issue with the old five vocals. But thank you all for staying tuned and listening to this and, and really not, not jumping off site when we had our technical issues. I'm glad we recovered. I want to thank Ryan, who's behind the scenes, sending me my notices about when I need to shut up. And if you have any more questions, I'm just going to scroll down here uh, to see. Uh, thank you, Peg. Appreciate it. And Jonathan, tell everybody about that legal boot camp and post that up so we can share it. You know, we're, we're all doing such great work in our community. Side tangent. We can all talk about being collaborative. A lot of times we write grants and we talk about collaborative efforts. But there's still competition. I believe in collaboration and not duplication of uh, efforts. Let's share ideas. Let's help us all build because ultimately we make our communities better. So it's not just a cliche to say, hey, I want this world to be better for my kid and my grandkids. We can actually do that by sharing knowledge and information. And so, Jonathan, put that legal boot camp up, share the pro bono um, uh, partnerships of Ohio information up there, which is great. And so thank you all very much. And if I can ever be of assistance, uh, don't hesitate to ever reach out to me and, and connect. Right? Uh, my greatest skill when Vanessa and the people wrote in there about leading with relationships, my success has come from building relationships. Sometimes not good, uh, but most of the time, 95% of the time is by building good relationships and friendships. And you know, wherever I've gone, I've had significant donors who have followed me to new agencies uh, to help out because they believe in, in me and they know that uh, I wouldn't pick a bad mission. And so this is one of those things. We're all building relationships and amongst ourselves as leaders in this community for the nonprofit world. You know, building this good relationship between us to share resources is something that I personally enjoy and I'm always open up to you know, for everybody, especially if you can learn and educate yourself. There's about two minutes left. Whenever Ryan just shuts me off, Ryan, go send me a notice and say, John, shut up. Uh, thank you, Rick. I really appreciate it. Uh, Brent. Thank you very much uh, as well. And thank you, nobody, for making uh, any comments about uh, my age and my love of Lieutenant Colombo or the Bishop's wife and some of the very old references that I use, especially Carol Burnett. I really love the Carol Burnett show. <laughs> so you all have a great, wonderful, blessed day. I look forward to being a participant in the rest of the day in several, several of the classes. And thank you very much, Jenny, and everyone else that's here in the future for allowing me to be a part of it.